This is Oldie McGoldie. I have to see this the other day. I was reading through some uh, uh, other stuff, but I have to see this. So I thought I would just bring this out. This is so awesome. A minister decided that a visual demonstration would add emphasis to his Sunday sermon. So he took four worms and he placed them in four separate jars. The first worm was put in a container of alcohol. The second worm was put in a container of cigarette smoke. The third worm was put in a container of chocolate syrup. And the fourth worm was put in a container of good, clean soil. At the conclusion of the sermon, the minister reported the following results. The first worm in the alcohol was dead. The second worm in the cigarette smoke was dead. The third worm in the chocolate syrup was dead. The fourth worm in the good soil was still alive. And he's just he's getting ready to tell what's going on. A little old lady in the back quickly raised her hand and said, I get it, I get it. As long as you drink, smoke, and eat chocolate, you won't have worms. <laughs> <laughs> oh, ain't got good. Oh, All right. Woo, look at that. Well, don't you wish you could go to something you broke and just push the button and say, hey, Lord, and you just fix that for me, and all of a sudden you see him just go, come on up here. Come on. Come on. There you go. Fix it all back again. <laughs> all right. So here we go. You read, watch it. So we've been talking this the last week. We're talking about the seven laws. Of the harvest. This is the last week. Somebody say praise God. <laughs> Amen. Uh, turn to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. This is probably one of the most awesome laws that God has in His Word. And when you see this, do I say you read watch this? So people start talking about money, 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 money. Well, if this is only about money, then I put dollar signs up there. You read watch this. So, but this is about every area of your life, every relationship of your life. On your job, with your children, with your wife, with your husband, with your in-laws, your outlaws, with all of them. With the church, with God. This is a universal rule that cannot be broken and it will work. Guaranteed, it will work every time. Get your Bibles out, turn to Galatians chapter 6, turn to verse 7, stand for the reading of the word. Ready? Here we go. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. In other words, I'm telling you that be not deceived. A lot of times we deceive ourselves because we think that no matter what we sow, we're going to reap a different harvest. I can guarantee you, if you sow sugar beets, you're not going to get corn. If you sow corn seed, you're not going to get apples. What you sow is what you're going to reap. God is not mocked, saying that God, you can't, you can't try to pull the wool over his eyes. You can pull the wool over my eyes. You can pull the wool over your spouse's eyes, your children's eyes. But you cannot pull the wool over God's eyes. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall reap to the flesh corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. I like his conditions. He gives us... It gives all kinds of promises in this word. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially them that are of the household of faith. That's just God to bless and to touch and anoint his word. Father, we love you. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Lord, we know, God, that right now, Lord, word is going to be sown. And Lord, I know, God, that it's going to go on fertile soil. But no matter what soil it falls on, I know this word eventually will come back and it will not come back void. I thank you, Lord, for all that you do, all that you say. I thank you, God, that you're in total control at all times. There's never a time that you're not in control. There's never a time that you don't have it going on. I thank you, God, for all you do, for all you say. And, Lord, let this word sink into fertile soil today. Lord, if there's somebody here that up to this moment has said, oh, it's just about money, or, oh, I don't mean anything, or I can do whatever I want to, and God, God's going to let me get by. No, let this day let it sink into their, not just their head, but into their spirit and their heart. And let them know that it is probably one of the most powerful promises that God has given us. It, it can be negative or it can be positive, but it's a guaranteed promise that's going to take place. Not my word, but yours, Lord. I ask you, Lord, to help all of us to think about it in a very powerful way. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, Amen. And we'll lay down and tell somebody, it's good to be here in the house of the Lord. Give them a high five, low five, no five, three and a quarter, three and a half, something. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right.
Now, this, remember now, now just, just, just a few, I mean, just a few slides from the last couple of weeks. For those that have not been here, for those that may have forgotten, for those that won't pay attention the last two weeks. <laughs> All right. Okay, Rick. That's funny. I don't care who you are. That's funny. All right. This is the year 2018. 2000 is the number of resurrection, new life, 18. 8 is the number of new beginnings. So this is going to be a very powerful year. And it's already happening for some of us. For others of us, it's going to be happening. And in order for you to see it fully in your own lives, you're going to have, I don't mean you're going to have to do what this thing tells us, okay? And we've got to fulfill our part. So in order for us to fulfill our part, to do our part, we've got to understand that God gives us these laws. It's the laws of the harvest. And these laws are universal. They work anywhere. They work in any these standards, particularly when Daniel was learning Spanish, Daniel kind of bored me one day because he was at the doctor's office and he said, Dad, you just come help me. You just come pull me and drive me back home after I go to the doctor's office. I said, all right. So I go in there and there's, a, there's some elderly uh, Hispanics sitting across and they're trying to talk to the girl behind the counter and she doesn't know what they're saying. And all of a sudden, she, he, they just start rattling off and all of a sudden Daniel says they're saying that they're having a headache and one's got a stomach ache and, and they need you to take the doctor look at them and they don't have this and that. And he went on down the line and I went, wow. I said, I didn't know that you learned how to speak Spanish that way. I said, well, Dad, I have a deputy. I didn't know this stuff. I said, so what do you do if you find, what, what, what do you do? You learn Spanish. What if I come to somebody that doesn't speak Spanish and doesn't speak English? She said, Daddy, I've got a universal language that anybody can understand. I said, you do so. What is it? He said, shh. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I don't care who they come from, what they are, what nationality. If I come up behind them and go, shh, he said, they automatically go, <laughs> so, these laws are universal. They're simple. You don't have to have some kind of college degree, some kind of master's degree, a doctor degree. This is simple. And it's absolute because this, it, this works in every area of your life. And it's stable. It will not fall. It will not fail. It works. Well, I guess say it works. It works. It works. Absolutely, it works. And so, this system of laws that is set up, uh, none are more important in all these laws, none are more important than, and significant than the, the, this right here. And that is the govern, or the, uh, the govern the harvest that we read. So here it is. The law of harvest, we're going to talk about some laws, we're going to talk about some other things. While well, a man sows, that shall he reap. So here, here's the laws of harvest. I'm getting ready to, this, this is getting ready to jump right into this week. So look, bear with me for a minute, though. The, the, the law of harvest can be divided into seven laws in three basic principles. We've gone over one basic principle so far, but here it goes. The first principle, harvest is a consequence. You don't just wake up one day and there it is, the harvest is there. Something is happening, either your action and or positive or negative, and your act or your lack of action or your inaction also brings a harvest. If you've got uh, something, if, you, if you've got a door that's deteriorating because it's being, it's got a crack in it and the rain is tearing all the pieces and you do nothing to it and it just keeps on and on and on and on, guess what you're going to read? A rotten door for your inaction. The same way, there's all kinds of ways. Inaction, action, positive, negative, whatever we do, God says, not me. Don't go and say what the preacher said. No, God said what we read, or what we sow, we will always read what we sow. Now here, here's the last slide from last week, and we're going to jump on into uh, uh, this week coming up. Ready? Let's get ready to go. You reap, watch you sow, so make sure you go sow good seeds. So here it is, watch this. He said, be not mocked, God is not deceived, for whatsoever. That kills if you think I'm just talking about money. That kills it. Matter of fact, that kid, you think I'm just talking about actions. Whatsoever. Actions. Attitude. Whatever you have in your possession. Whatever you have control over. Or think you have control over. Whatever it is. Whatsoever. He didn't, he didn't put any specifications on it. Whatsoever a man soweth. Whatever it is. You think of something. Any action you do, any word that comes out of your mouth, you're sowing a seed. Any word. You know, I, I've been thinking about this so hard, and I try to do it all the time anyway, but lately, uh, when I go and I come up with somebody, I'll try to find something. Immediately when I see them, I try to find something nice about them. 
you know, uh, something I know they have done or something about them right then, and I will immediately start talking about whatever that is, and then I'll get into God's got good things for you. You just got to trust Him. And they'll go, well, how did you know that I'm having such a hard time now? Just about every time. How did you know I was having a hard time? Well, you know what? If I hadn't started out with something good, they probably wouldn't tell me they were going through something bad. And I mean, people I don't even know, other than through acquaintance, or work with Bethany, or work with D.C., or Daniel. You know, they come up to me and say, you know, D.C. and Daniel's friends call me Pop, or Dad. And they come and say, hey, Pop, hey, Dad. And I'll go, yeah, I ain't seen you in a while, blah, blah, blah. And I go, you know what? I always remember the time you did such and such, and it was so awesome. You know, and, and then they'll go, well, you know what? I'm really having a hard time now. And so it gets a chance for me to talk to them and, and try to lift them up, try to encourage them. And, and so again, remember, whatever you sow with them, by your mouth, by your actions, by your attitude. Some people at times have a stinking attitude. I know y'all don't. I probably preach to the wrong people. If somebody here ever has a stinking attitude, that's somewhere. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> that was scared me to start with, though, man. Let me check my attitude real quick. <laughs> Am I? Yeah. All right, ready? So, here we go. See, here it goes. Here, here, here it goes. These are some laws. Seed always surrenders to the law of reproduction. Whatsoever you sow, you're going to reap. Your seed always surrender, also surrenders to the power of reproduction. We always reap more than we sow. So if you sow 10 seeds, you're going to reap a lot more. Remember the corn we talked about last week? I got it kind of backwards. Eddie reminded me, uh, one little piece of corn, I'm cutting it short, one little piece of corn drop can, can, can uh, cause one stalk to grow. One stalk has three ears of corn. Three ears of corn has about 250 pieces of corn on each. And so if you look at it and, and see all this, actually that one little corn reproduces itself 750 times, which is seven. 75,000% increase. Wow. So you say, well, well, I don't understand. Well, I don't understand why that person is so mad at me. Well, maybe it's because you sowed that seed, you're getting back 750. Uh oh. Well, I don't understand why I'm not getting any help from all of these people. Well, you had that chance to sow that one little seed, now you're getting back 750. Woo! So, so it could be whatever the seed is, it doesn't have to be that number, but still. You always, there, there's, there's the law of reproduction, you're going to reap what you sow. The power of reproduction, you always reap more than you sow. And then there is the path of reproduction, we always reap where we sow. In other words, if your marriage is hurting right now, don't be worried about everybody else's marriage, you better worry about yours. If you have problems with your children right now, don't be going to try to take care of everybody else's child, fix their problems, you better take care of you and your child. Because I'm telling you, where you sow is where you're going to reap. There's nothing wrong with helping the other people. But if you're having a problem, you better address that problem and you better take care of it. I've seen people get fired at Procter & Gamble and fired at Fountain because they were having problems in their area, but they were too busy trying to solve problems in other areas. And the boss said, but your job is failing, your job is wrong. Don't do it. But I'm helping that person. Well, that person's doing what they're supposed to do. You should be here. I remember coaching basketball. And, and we, our team was awesome. We, we, we really were doing good. And, and we had a guy named Brandon. And D.C. was my power forward. And Brandon was my center. And D.C. And, and Brandon both were very, very tall compared to the rest of the guys on the team. And so, I, so D.C. And, and Brandon were up. I kept him in the paint all the time. And, and Brandon and us said, Brandon, here's what I want you to do. I need you to stay under the net. I need you to rebound for me. He said, why is that, Coach? I said, because you're very tall. I didn't want to tell them this though, and they're very clumsy. So I need you to stand still. Let DC, DC's not clumsy. Let DC take care of the moving. You just take care of standing here and grab the ball from DC. Or whoever else is here. He could, he could definitely rebound. Well, one day, after he knew that, in every practice, he stayed in there to rebound. One day, after, one day in a game, he pulls over and he jumps over and he pulls over in everybody's spot and shoots the ball in everybody, everybody else's spot. He shoots power forward. He shoots the, the driving forward. He goes back here. He shoots the, the I mean, he's just everybody. He's, he's just taking care of every the point guard, the other guard. He's just taking care of everything. He was shooting from all over the place. He was banking. People were hollering. I looked over at his daddy, who was my assistant coach. And I did like this. He said, I know. Do what you got to do. 
I said, come here, Brandon. He said, didn't you just ask me to hear points for us? I said, yeah, that was awesome. I said, on the beach. He said, because you made 10 points. I said, that's the last ones you're going to make for a while. Sit on the bench. He said, but I said, your points are still made under that net. You make more points under that net doing what you're supposed to do. You make a bunch of points. Uh, second chance uh, shots off rebounds. I said, that's where you, you're good at. I said, the other guys are out there in case you miss or in case you throw it to them. But you're supposed to stay under there, get second, second chance uh, points, get the rebounds, pass it to whoever. I said, and what are you doing? He said, well, I just want to show you my skill. I said, I know your skill is under the net. He said, what should we do, coach? I said, I told you what we should do, sit on the bench. <laughs> and so he sit on the bench, and he's, he's going, they need me, coach, they need me. I said, but I need you to listen to me more than they need you to shoot. Come on, somebody. God's got some of y'all sitting on the bench and wondering why. Mm, I put that right there for $100. Get that shit out of here. <laughs> Finally, after the game, after I mean, just about toward the end of the game, I looked at him and he was going, Oh, we're going to go to real. I said, You better show me a better attitude while you're on that bench. So finally, he's sitting on the bench going, Go, guys, go, guys, go, guys. And he was going, That's right. And when he started doing that, I said, Okay, get up. Go back out there. I said, Where are you going to play? He said, Under the net. I said, Why about the ball goes over there? He said, I'm still under the net. I said, Why do they try to holler for you to come here? He said, I'm still under the net, coach. I never had to bench him again, ever. He stayed under that net. So again, think about this. Some people right now, you're benched. You wonder, God, why you bench me? It's because you're so busy planting other fields. I mean, you need to be planting your own. You need to be getting the harvest out of your own, out of your own problems. Here we go. Here it goes. I'm going to go ahead and I'm, a, I'm going to show you uh, the harvest principles. Here it is. Watch this. Oh, look at this. I love this. I love this. This battery. This battery. I keep turning. When I slide this in the, in the sleeve, it turns it on and leaves it on, so that's why my battery gets dead all the time. Don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds that you plant. Wow. Let me ask you a question. Are you planting? I can answer that. Yep. Every time you open that mouth, you're planting. Every time you open that mouth when you shouldn't, you're planting. Every time you keep that mouth closed when it should be open, you're planting. Every time you help somebody, you're planting. Every time you hurt somebody, you're planting. Every time you should be helping somebody and you keep your hands in your pocket, you're planting. Just remember this. Every action that you do in your life, you're planting. So, number one, harvest is a consequence. We will always reap what we sow. Number two, harvest is a process. It takes time and it takes steps. And number three, harvest is a season. There's an appropriate time or a due season that we reap. You say, well, God, I pay the seeds. Where is it at? I don't see a harvest. Well, you got to give, give, give the seed a chance to germinate. you got to give the seed a chance to actually come up and spring forth and start bearing fruit. I was talking with a lady last night. She came to me and she was so excited. She said, how could be? She said, I've been talking to these young men for years. And I thought I was just talking to myself. This is not like anything was happening. And she said, finally. Finally, this young man, after he got married, and, and uh, I think he's got a child now, said he finally come up one day in, in, all, in, in church and got saved. Not only did he get saved, he got excited. He got excited about God and said, I want everything God's got for me. And he's been doing this now for almost a year. Not only has he gotten fired up about God, but now he's causing these other guys to listen to him that wouldn't listen to her. And now, now, more stuff is springing up around. You know what I told her? I said, you were you are, you are patient in the process of planting the seeds. And finally, one of the seeds popped up. And I said, just when you thought it was not going to be any good, it was not working, this guy pops up, and because of his excitement, and because he can talk to the other guys, now the other guys are rising up. So I said, see, your seed was not planted in vain. God took it and worked with it. It just didn't happen when you were expecting it to happen. Amen? So, so here we go. Get ready. That was, that was uh, the harvest principles. Now, here goes another law. Ready? Here's another law. Come on, buddy. You can do it. We reap in proportion to what we sow. This was the biggest thing I needed to learn when I first started sowing. And I really believe that a lot of people, if they would learn this, it would help them tremendously. We reap in proportion to what we sow. 
2 Corinthians 9 and 6 says, Now this we say, or I say, He that sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. But he that sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Okay, God, I understand I'm going to plant something. So you go put a little seed out there and leave it all by itself and put that great big old field. Even when it comes up, you can't see it because it's so small. Or you can go ahead and say, I got you, God, and go ahead and plant some seed. I mean, plant them. Put them out there. And then when it comes up, it'll flood the place. You'll see it'll be awesome. But matter of fact, when you see this scripture right here, the first thing it talks about, actually, watch this now, is, is it deals with personal responsibility. We keep looking for people to blame about our problems. It's somebody else's fault. Blah, blah, blah. It's their fault. It's their fault. It's their fault. You know what? I sowed so my way out of a lot of problems. And I don't mean just financially again. There's been some guys that I had problems with, guys at work, guys wherever, guys in school. I had problems with them, and I would start sowing, and I start sowing good seed in this relationship. And, and I'd always find that it always came back. When I sowed good seed into that relationship, instead of giving them what they were giving me, Instead of giving back negative for negative, because you sow negative, you're going to reap negative. You sow the flesh, you're going to reap the flesh. I was so positive, and I sow the spirit. And it's amazing how God will turn these situations around. So quit looking for somebody to blame. Get out your shell. Get out your seed. It's also talking about faithfulness. Don't just talk about it. I get it. Honestly, I, as a pastor, I have heard if I can tell you how many times I've heard this, well, Pastor, we're about to. We're going to. You just wait. <coughs> well, for some people, I've been waiting so long. In fact, I think I did their funeral. I'm still waiting. <laughs> well, my, favorite, my favorite thing was down yeah, there working in the churchyard, and somebody dropped by and said, Pastor, I was on the way to the dump. I thought church might could use this. Oh. That's right. That's horrible. I, I, DC's shaking his head because DC's not able to be hurt. I don't know how many times. Hundreds of times. Well, it's not good enough for me. It needs to be an adult. Maybe I'll give it to God. He'll bless it. Oh, okay. That's not just so sparingly. That's kind of. Well, okay. I'll leave it alone. All right. Faithfulness. And then finally, come on, baby, you can do it. All right, it just shows faith. You know, it's possible for you to limit your own harvest. Here's the harvest. It's right there, and the potential's right in front of you. But you just, you're scared to, 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 to throw the ball. You're scared to reach up to catch the ball. You're scared to, 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 to step out on faith. You're scared to step out of the boat. No, you know, you're in that little comfort zone. And that comfort zone is a lot of pain. That comfort zone is not always a good place to be because that comfort zone can have a lot of pain. You can have a lot of issues. But the reason it's called a comfort zone is because at least you know what to expect there. There's people that stay in relationships that shouldn't because of the comfort zone. There's people that, that, that stay in all kinds of things because of comfort zones. And they stay in the pain because at least they know what to expect. But you know what? Nothing ever good come out of comfort zones. Peter had to get out of the boat to walk on the water. You gotta learn to start figuring out ways to step out of the boat and give God glory and give God honor. Amen. So here we go. It is good stuff. Okay, I hope so. I know so, but I hope y'all hope so. Amen. Once I learned this stuff, it made my life so much different, so much better. Okay, there you go. He just says sparingly. They're gonna read sparingly. He just says about to bleed. See, there's a dead, there's a dead plant on one side. There's a vibrant. Hang on the other. So let me just show you something. You know. This, this, this is so awesome. If you want to have more than enough, and this goes against everything you think in your head, it goes against everything your flesh is talking about. It goes against everything Satan tries to tell you. But this right here is a fact. If you want more than enough, give. If you want less than enough, grasp. Gimme, give gimme, give gimme. Give my name's Jimmy. Gimme, gimme, gimme. Give give the person that grasps usually lives a cold, hard, lonely life. But a person that gives, wow. There's relationships galore. There's all kinds of stuff happening around them. Their life.
life is full of joy and spunk. So, look, I see this. If you want abundance, scatter. If you want to be needy, pour. That's what, that's what Jesus said. Jesus said that, that, that the, the guy with one seed, the guy with five seeds, the guy with two seeds, or excuse me, talents, five talents, two talents, and one talent, and on five talents and two talents, went out and traded, come back, and one had four, and one had ten. But the other one went and hid it in the ground. He hoarded it. He hid it in the ground. He hoarded it. And so when the master came back, he said, how come that one five has got ten, and the one two has got four, and ran according to his ability? But the moment one, he said, why are you still only got one? He said, I know you're a hard man. I was scared you were going to be upset with me when you come back if I had lost it. So I hoarded it. And he said, give me that. He took it, gave it to the woman 10. And he said, you, you're going to be casting out of darkness for the weeping and gnashing of teeth. So here it is, so simple. If you want abundance, scatter. And I don't mean just money. Again, you know, you've got to get your mind out of this, just money. Money is an important part of this, and money does count in this. But you got to remember, attitudes, actions, it's all kinds of things. you got to think about it. All areas of your life. If you want abundance, scatter. If you want to be needy, hoard. Every area of your life. And here it goes. Here goes another one. Here's another principle. I'll just put principles up there. Or laws. We reap in a different season than we sowed. I sowed, they sowed today. There's some seeds I sowed in D.C. and Daniel, and I sowed them for years. And then there was a time where I didn't see any progress at all. Matter of fact, all I was back and back, back and back and back and back. And every time I get up here, and I look up just like today, I was up here and, and we were playing, and, and D.C. says, so, D.C. said, Dad, now you got to get that walk down right. And all I could think about was when he was a little bit and his fingers were barely fit on the strings. I said, oh, son, you got to stretch that finger. You got to, but it hurts, Daddy. I know it hurts, but you're going to get calluses. And I was so cool that when we got Beth and we had to be fingerprinted, because we, first, we were first foster parents and we had to be fingerprinted. And so we're in the sheriff's office, we're getting fingerprinted. And they looked at me and they said, You're a musician, aren't you? I said, Yes, sir. I said, Why are you asking me that? He said, Look at your fingerprints. And so in the FBI now it says, David Linton's got scars. Got scars on my fingers. And and I said, Wow, I didn't pay attention. They said, Yes, so you're going to be kind of hard, easy to track. He said, Not only got your fingerprints, but now you got scars too, and these scars will be there from playing that bass. I said, Wow, I never even had any idea. He said, Yep. And DC Potter said, I got scars too. And the guy went, God, and the guy looked at said, said, Okay, where? <laughs> and this is how I just started playing the bass, but I got him. You got to trust me. They're there, just like daddy's. There's one there. <laughs> I think about that. Now he's over here telling me what, how, to, how to do it, what to do, but how to do it also. And I'll sit back and I just, I sit back and think, you know what? All those years of all that sowing and having to be patient and so and so and so, and now it's coming back like nobody's business. And I think, See, you may serve today in somebody's life, but it may not come back for years. But when it comes back, be ready. Because usually when it comes later, it's going to be awesome. You're not even going to know what to do with it. So we reap in a different season than we sow. It says we're in due season. In due season. Season. So watch this now. That we're due at first to an occasion, set, or a proper time. I, I like this. It, it, here it is. Watch this. It, it, it's, it's a convenient season or a short time. So God's got an appointed time. Did you know that? God's got an appointed time for everything. That's the awesome part. Here comes the not so awesome part. Get ready. Especially those that are hyperactive, high paid personalities. Get ready. It can't be changed by us. God's got a time, and you can keep on, you can try your best to change it. All that's going to happen to change it is you're going to mess it up. Matter of fact, why I want to change if God had, if God was going to restore my seed 
If I, if I see I was going to reap a hundredfold, why don't I reap twofold, get ahead of myself, or reap less than that because I, I got in the way? Heck, I'll take care of it. Uh, you know, it's going to happen. It's a guarantee it's going to happen. Because I remember what God said in His Word. He says here, watch this. He says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. Genesis 8 and 22. One more. Get ready. Here we go. Let's get here. We go. Here we go. <coughs> we reap the full harvest. Remember, two time. Here's another law. We reap the full harvest only if we persevere. You gotta stay in there. You got to stay in there. Watch this. Don't grow weary. We're well doing. We'll reap if we faint not. So watch this. It means more than taking a breather. Get ready. I talked to somebody yesterday. Somebody yesterday came to me and said, said, I didn't, I didn't realize they were on Mighty Army. These people have been on Mighty Army now for about six months. I didn't even know it. I didn't know it when I put them in, but I hadn't even thought about it. And this person came up to me uh, because they don't go to our church. They're not even around here. I just happened to bump into them uh, in town. And they said, man, I've got to tell you something. That mighty army. And I said, well, praise God. I said, I'm just a delivery boy. I'm a I'm Western Union guy. It's not me. It's God. And they said, yeah. And I said, I've well, got to tell you something. I said, what you got to tell me? They said, I was in college. I was at the registrar's office. I was so discouraged that I was getting ready to drop out. I was there to drop out. And my phone went ding, ding, while I was waiting. I pulled it up and said, Bonnie Army, next time you think about quitting, remember the reason that you started. Wow. That's God. <laughs> David Linton. David ain't got nothing to do with that. That's all God. And so I got a chance to talk to him a little bit about this. Since see, growing weary, if we faint not, that's, that's actually a compound. Growing weary and not fainting. You put it together. It means more than taking a breather. It means to even it means to do more than quit. Listen carefully. Please listen carefully. Because here's where some of y'all are at right now. And I get there from time to time myself. Get ready. Grow weary is a process. It means to fade away. So to grow weary doesn't mean it happens overnight. It just, just keeps picking away and picking away and picking away and picking away. You're, you're wanting to do something about it, but you just can't. So you just, you just grow wearier and wearier and wearier. <coughs> it just picks away and picks away. Kind of like somebody with diabetes or somebody with cancer. You watch them and you know I'm always going to be a big person. You don't see them for a couple of months and they're smaller. You don't see them for another couple of months and they're even smaller. And, and then finally you get to them and they look like, look like they're just pure skeletons because they're just, the, the, the disease is taking them out. And so, so again, grow weary is a process. Well doing is just doing the right thing. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever get tired of doing the right thing? Or well, you can be honest. Don't raise your hand, but just, you know, think about it. You get thinking, I keep doing it, I keep doing it, I have to go out of my way. You know, uh, my Uncle Ralph forgot I moved to Washington, I reckon. One night I was sitting here working on a sermon, and Uncle Ralph called me up and said, he said, uh, Cricket, I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm having a problem. I said, what kind of problem you having, Uncle Ralph? He said, I, he, he was getting in bad shape. He said, he's really in bad shape now. He said, my wood box is empty. And it says, I can't go out of that back porch and pick up that wood. He said, I can take it from the wood box to the, up to the stove because right next to it. He said, I can't do all that. He said, can you come put some wood in my wood box for me? I was working on a sermon. I'd already been in the hospital trying to hurt me that sermon then. And, and so I said, I didn't say, do you remember I don't live there anymore? I didn't. I just said, Uncle Ralph, can I bring it to you tomorrow for church? You got in the class tonight, I'll come tomorrow for church and stop. I'll put your wood in your box. He said, Well, I really need some now. Then I went and he said, I've asked everybody else, but nobody's got time. And he said, and here I am, said, yeah, I need some wood for tonight. And I said, So I made some calls. And people he said he called, I called, they weren't there. So uh, I was gonna say, How about I go up the house and get him some wood? So 
So Linda said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to pull Linda's wood box. So I drove all the way from Slatestone to Hossman Track, get out of the car. As I'm walking up to his door, he goes to the door and says, I'm so sorry, but I forgot you moved. And I said, but didn't I tell you if you ever needed me, all you had to do was call me? He said, yeah. I said, well, didn't you need me? He said, yeah. I said, didn't you call me? He said, yeah. I said, did I tell you to be here? He said, yeah. And I filled it up. I mean, I filled it up to the brim. I mean, I filled it up so good. And he said, I'm so sorry I got I disturbed you. I said, you didn't disturb me. He said, but for some reason, I thought, well, I just saw you driving down the driveway. I said, it's somebody else on the route. It's dark. They want me. I said, it's okay. You need me, you call me. So then I, I go to the chalk wing. I had to stop uh, to Burger King. And I went to stop Burger King to pick up something. And when I go to pick up, there's another guy hollering. David! And I'm thinking, I hope he's not calling me because I need to get home. I'm going to go And so I turn and look. And as the guy I grew up with, I said, how you doing, man? He said, come here. I come over there and he said, I just want you to know I just had a heart transplant. And I'm having a hard time. I want you to pray. And I said, okay. We have our hands and pray. And then he starts telling me about all this. And so 30 minutes later, I get in the car. I didn't even get anything working. Got in the car and I drove home. So it took me about an hour or two to do all this. But all I could hear in my head was, did good, son. You didn't grow weary in doing what was right. I was up at 2 o'clock in the morning working on the sermon, but that's okay. I know. I sit back and look at it. I really feel bad if Uncle Ralph had a, had a diet that night or Uncle Ralph had, had a problem that night and I didn't have time to go take care of his wood. And I felt bad that guy, he's sitting there talking, his chest is still hurting because he got an infection out there, had his heart put in and blah, 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 blah. You know, but again, don't grow weary in well doing. Doing. Well, that's right. Here's what this is now. If you take this compound and put it together, grow weary and think, here it is. This is what it is. Remember, remember, when Paul talks, Paul talks about the military. And Paul talks about the Olympics. That's the two biggest things he talks about. This is an Olympic thing. The Olympics are on right now. It's the picture of someone quitting with the finish line in sight. That's what growing weary and fainting means. Literally it means to quit with the finish line in sight. Wow. There was a lady, she was trying to swim, swim the English Channel. I can't think of her name, but she was trying to swim the English Channel, and it was foggy. She's going along. She's getting cramps. It's cold. She's even being stung, and she's going along, and she finally goes, I can't go any further. I can't go any further. I've got to quit. The fog was there. She couldn't see anything. She couldn't see the goal. Couldn't see, couldn't see the other side. All she saw was the fog. And she's going along, and she's going along, and she's going along. And she said, I can't go any further. I've got to quit. And she stopped. The fog lifted. And she was within a few yards of making it. Wow. So it's right now, it's foggy around you. You think there's no wind inside. You're thinking you're doing this for all, this for all wrong reasons. There's no reason why you're even thinking because you're not getting any harvest. You're going to realize the finish line's in sight. You've got to keep on going. You can't stop. you got to keep on going. You can't give in. You can't give in. There's so many people depending on you. There's, there's a buddy of yours right now in a spiritual foxhole who needs you to have his back. And you need to have his back. It's not time to quit. It's not time to give in. It's time to dig down and get even, get even stronger. You see, and that word, that word faint, Let's watch this. That word faint doesn't just mean to quit. That word faint means to quit and walk away. To quit and quit trying. Just walk away. I've never in my entire life seen so many people quit things and walk away like I have in this day and time. It's the day we live in. They don't just quit and they walk away. They're not just saying, well, I may pick it back up later or will you give me a little break? No, they just walk away. Just walk away. And again, to me, 
a measure of a spiritual man and a spiritual woman and a spiritual, really true spiritual mark of maturity is to get rid of that, that, that quit and walk in the way. It's hanging in there, staying in there in the fight. Because there's a lot of people you don't even know that's depending on you. So, we reap the full harvest so and we hang in there. And there's the last one, I'm quitting. So I say, praise God. <laughs> Y'all have sounds enthusiastic about <laughs> right. it. I can't do anything about last year's harvest. But I can about this year's. Last year's is done gone. Harvest is gone. Matter of fact, I've already carried it to the market. Already got, already got laid out. It used to be fun to watch my granddaddy. We got there and he'd have his corn or have his tobacco, especially tobacco. He had these great old big sheets and he'd put tobacco on the sheets and then he would take them and he'd tie it up, you know, and throw them on the back of his truck and he'd get there and pull them down and they'd put them and they would the auctioneer would auction them off. They'd auction them off over there. Uh, now there's, there there's a, a Mexican restaurant uh, over, over down there by, by Moore's Automotive, uh, corner of 5th and 7th. 5th Street and 17th Street. Uh, you know, I'm over at the back of the warehouse. Right there. Somebody help me out. I don't feel like I'm... Oh, there you go. Yeah. Okay, I was trying to take you. Am I missing it? <laughs> I remember. He got here to sell us tobacco. Okay, so swatch this down. I can't do anything about last year. Last year, actually, I'm going to tell you. Let me, let me just... Let me just let me show you this. Luke 9, 6, I'm going to show you something about the scripture. Some of y'all already know because I've talked about it before. Some of y'all already know it before I talk about it. Some of you don't know it yet, but you're going to know it before we leave. The Bible says, And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Do not raise your hands, please. But how many think it's talking about fit for heaven? Don't raise your hands. It's not talking about heaven. It's talking about man. Can I, can I use your walker? Take the brakes off the bathroom. Yeah, take the brakes off. Oh, they're all okay. Let's oh, see. This is no plow. Man, it's awesome. This is a high, high tech plow. I got four wheels. Oh, look. When it says, any man putting his hand to the plow, meaning, now I'll start a plow. Put my hand to it. Any man, it's talking about now, not heaven. Now. Any man putting his hand to the plow and looking back is not fit for the kingdom of God. What the world does that mean? Here's an agricultural term now. Because now Jesus is talking. Jesus is talking in agricultural terms most of the time. So here's Jesus. Watch this. A man puts his hand to the plow in order to sow. How many ever plowed before? You had to keep your eyes on it. You couldn't take your eyes off of it because you didn't want to cross the roads. In order for it to be good, get a good yield, you got to do it right. Now watch this. So, so, so when I'm plowing, I've plowed before. I plowed on a tractor. I plowed not a mule, but I, uh, if you count my brothers as a mule. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I've got to look where I'm going. Watch this. Though. Here's what I'm talking about. Watch. Any man putting his hands in the plow, watch this, and looking back. I'm sorry. Yeah, but you see that I'm like, yeah. That's what Jesus is talking about. Any man that puts his hands to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. You know why? Because he's he's doing a sloppy job of sowing. He's doing a sloppy job of agriculture. He's doing a sloppy job of taking care of his family. He's doing a sloppy job of taking care of business. He's doing a sloppy job. And so, as he's doing a sloppy job, not fit for the kingdom of God, literally he's talking about, look, look, you're there and you're doing it, but, but God's not honored by it. I want God to be honored by what I do. Matter of fact, I want to be productive. When it comes to break up the father ground in our hearts, then we're the father ground. How many of you ever seen somebody come by? I used to live in the country. Uh, and all I ever see was, was filing ground. Filing ground was after harvest. After a harvest, they would come through and harvest it, and you see the corn, you see the corn stalks still up, or you'd see pieces of from the field, little stuff, whatever the stuff was to harvest if you laid on the ground. The ground would get hard and crusty, 
and there'd be old corn stalks or whatever. And if you tried to plow, if you tried to plant on that, it would never come up. You had to break up that pile of ground. You had to get a plow, a disc and a hair. You had to go through and cut the stuff up, and then you had to pull it up. And when you got through, it looked like brand new all over again. That's breaking up the pile of ground. So, again, look at this. The man put his hands to the plow and looking back. It's fit for the kingdom. Watch this. You know what looking back does? I like what John Wayne said. John Wayne said, John Wayne said it was pretty, he said it's a bad half looking back. <laughs> he said, so you might get shot. I also like what John Wayne said. John Wayne said, with courage, you know what John Wayne said courage was? John Wayne said courage is being scared and saddled up anyway. All right, John Wayne. Matter of fact, watch this. I started to wear it. So I saw what John Wayne says, and so I read the John Wayne shirt. But you cannot count the number of apples in the seed. 